Hello, creative people. Welcome to Creative Conversations. My name is Hollis Citron, and we are so happy that you have chosen to spend this hour with us. So I am owner and founder of I Am Creative and Express Yourself Publishing, and I am on a mission to expand the definition of creativity beyond a pencil and a paintbrush and empower people, especially adults, to own their voice that come in so many different forms. So this space was created to talk with people with all different jobs, hobbies, and interests, and have conversations about experiences and perspectives all centered around three questions. One, how do you define creativity? Two, how do you incorporate it into your life? And three, why do you think it's important? Then we have a free-flowing conversation and we see where it goes. So I have had the opportunity to talk to musicians, Reiki masters, mediums, doctor, lawyer, real estate agents, and so many more. And these conversations explore the reality that creativity is not cute, it is necessary. People have defined creativity as their soul's essence, courage, imagination, basically all that we are and want to be. So sharing these stories expands one's thinking and opens up self-expression to feel more empowered, connected, and dare I say, happy. So my inspiring guest for today is Scott Kirker. Scott is a recovering finance guy turned tech entrepreneur, life coach, and gratitude enthusiast. He recently launched Gradverse, a social platform where you can build gratitude together. Scott, welcome to the space. Oh, thank you so much for having me. What a joy it is to be on the podcast. I'm such a fan. Oh, well, thank you. I am so happy to have you here, and I can't wait for people to learn about you. So I just read that tiny sliver about you. Can you let us know a little bit more about who you are before we dive in? Oh, man, you start with a big question. Uh, <laughs> who, who a we? little a little sliver. <laughs> um, so as you said, I am a uh, I'm recovering finance guy turned uh, tech entrepreneur. Um, I am... Um, I'm from, the, I'm from the Philadelphia area, uh, as I believe you are as well. Uh, yep. So a lot of Philly pride here between the two of us. Yeah, um, of course. So uh, I grew up in the area. Uh, my, my dad, my father was a banker. My, my mother was an art history professor at Penn State. Uh, so, I mean, obviously a pretty, a pretty wide variety between those two, but they worked awesome together as, as a couple and as, uh, as, as parents to me. Uh, as I sort of got older and looked at sort of how I wanted to approach my career, my life, you know, obviously you look to your parents uh, and you say like, what, which, which, which one of those do I like? And, you know, I'll go that way as a, you know, you're young, you don't know that there's a whole spectrum of everything in the world you could do. Right. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, I was taking finance courses and uh, art history classes and philosophy classes at, at Penn State when I went to school. And uh, ended up actually and sort of going the track of finance, uh, found love with uh, actually with, with econ, um, you know, microeconomics, my first econ course really hooked me. But it wasn't, uh, it wasn't because you know, I loved numbers or math or, or making gobs of money or anything. It was sort of the, the intentionality of choices baked into what econ you know, economics is. It's actually more of a psychological <laughs> idea of what rational behavior is than it is about uh, dollars and cents. So like that hooked me early and that led me to a path of finance uh, and uh, was lucky enough to, to do well enough in my studies and have, have enough success to get into investment banking, which was, you know, the, the coup de grace if you were a, an undergrad of finance, getting an investment banking analyst job was what you, you were hoping for. And so, you know, I was I actually, I cried when I, in pleasure, when I, in, in joy, when I got my, when I got my job offer because I, I thought I had sort of, I had made it to what the pinnacle of what I, I could do at the time. Um, yeah. And so I went to work for now Wells Fargo was Wachovia's investment bank uh, down in Charlotte. And very quickly uh, real world sort of hit you in the face about like, Oh, this may not be what you want to do. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. It's a lot, it's a lot of hours. It's a lot of, it's a lot of work. And I learned a ton and worked with some very smart people. Uh, so there's no like, uh, ill will or anything to the people I worked with or the, the companies, but I just, it wasn't what I wanted to be doing. Um, so I, I looked quickly after, you know, year and change for how do I get to a more manageable uh, work-life balance? How do I get to 
not so much me trying to sell services to other people, but me uh, being in the power seat of the conversations. Uh, and that led me to a small private equity shop in, in, in the Philadelphia area. And private equity is like, we'll call it the buy side. So we were buying companies um, and selling companies, which is, you know, it sounds you know, sexy to a lot of people. Uh, but it's still, you know, what I realized is I was still too disconnected uh, from what was being created, what, w- what they were actually doing, who was building things. We were sort of, we were financial engineers. We weren't engineers. Uh, yeah. And it's, mm-hmm. I didn't know that I wanted to be that kind of person until, you know, a few years into this, this career of mine, you know, when I'm in my mid twenties and, and I'm not, I realized I'm not building anything. Um, and that really struck me. And I knew at that point, like, you know, we were talking to at the private equity firm that I, I worked at, we were, we were buying small, but cash flow positive and growing companies. Um, and so oftentimes it was still the, the founders who were the ones that we were talking to that we were working with to take them, you know, we're giving them quote unquote growth equity, uh, to take them to the next level of, of sort of size and scale. But we were still talking to the people who were there when the company was nothing. Um, and what I, I came to respect deeply was the work that they had done was the real work. Like mm. we were, we were going to help take a company from 10 million of sales to 50 million of sales. And that's, that's important and helpful. Uh, but like they knocked on doors, started companies, you know, created, you know, gravity by what they did. And I, I, I just, that's what I wanted to do. And mm-hmm. I was tired of being the person who wasn't, wasn't doing it. Um, and so my career evolved in a direction to create things. And the question was, what was I going to create? Um, and that led me to business school at, at Babson, where I went to, to do a program in entrepreneurship um, for my MBA. And after I did a, another short stint with, with the guys that I had worked with before in private, in private equity, I, I took, you know, I parted ways and I realized I wanted to build something on my own. And I wanted to do that in a space where I could scale, not just to, you know, my local neighborhood, which is fine, but I didn't, that's not, I wanted to go bigger. I wanted to scale to something that could touch millions of people and technology was the, was the way to do that. And so mm-hmm. that got me to this idea of building a tech company and indirectly what became Grativerse uh, through time. So that was an evolution in of itself, but try not to be too wordy uh, at <laughs> the start to introduce myself. <laughs> so here we, that gets us to today. This is, yeah. And this is where we're going to dive deeper into all of this. Mm-hmm. And I have to address, as you were saying, you realize that you weren't creating anything. I thought of the movie Pretty Woman. <laughs> Where she's like, okay. so what are you doing? Like, what do you make? Like, you, so you take pieces of the company and then you take them apart. And then what do you do with it? And he was kind of like, huh, I'm not mm-hmm. doing anything that's really of <laughs> value for the greater good. I'm just taking something, taking it apart and making money. So... Yeah, I think I, there's, listen, there's some entertainment sort of uh, slant to, to private equity that, that can make right. it seem far nefarious than it actually is. Um, right. But I, I do think there is an element of, I, I've always, for my career has been thus far, seeing other people at the other side of the table and realizing, why am I pitching to them? I want to be them. So, mm-hmm. and, and it wasn't because they had the power or it was a power play. It was like, that's who I, they had built things and I respected that. And that was what I wanted to be. I wanted to be somebody who was a builder. You want to be Scott the Builder. So, okay. <laughs> so we're going to dive in, but first we're going to do our would you rather question and sure. then we'll do question one. So first I want to welcome the people that are here live. Thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate you. Any questions or comments, please feel free to put them in the chat box below and you can be part of the conversation. So Scott, would you rather have a pet tiger or a pet ferret? Okay, so this is actually super easy because in college I had a roommate who did have ferrets, uh, <laughs> and I will not lie, they are really cute, but they are awful. <laughs> they <laughs> are <terrible>. right. <laughs> um, now I say that, but then again, I've watched Tiger King, and I don't know that I want a tiger either. <laughs> so <laughs> this is this is turned into a really like one of those like dark would you rather? Um, <laughs> obviously, for for scale of problem, I'll go with the ferrets. Um, 
but I know I'm not going to be happy about it. And I'm just going to, yeah, they, go- they may become, they may become, uh, is there, they're wild ferrets I'm sure, somewhere, right? So maybe they just become wild ferrets pretty quickly. <laughs> That's so funny that I was totally drawn to that question. I was like, I just have to ask him that. And there uh, there was a connection. <laughs> so your final answer would be you would take the ferret, even though you really don't want the ferret, but maybe it'd be set free. Uh, yeah, I think that ferret, uh, the open door policy might apply uh, to the <laughs> ferret. And like, I think there's, I don't know if you're a cat person or not. Um, yes. But there is so... Cats always crack me up. I, I'm not a cat or a dog person. I, I, I think they both have their own pros and cons. But the, there's a comedian who does a great bit about cats. And anytime you see the poster of Lost Cat, it's actually saying Cat Liberated. Um, <laughs> and so, like, I think that I think that I will liberate my ferret very quickly. And if, if it comes back, cool. And if not, just as well. It is it's free. <laughs> I set you free. Yeah. <laughs> I have to tell a quick story. I guess for selfish reasons, I thought of this. Um, <laughs> it happened in Philadelphia. So my roommate, one of my roommates in college also had a ferret. Her boyfriend had a ferret. <laughs> and the ferret got out. It got loose. And a homeless guy found it on the street. And we were looking for the ferret. And this guy was holding the ferret. And this Jamie, her boyfriend, is like, that's my ferret. He's like, the guy was like, it's mine. And he just ripped the ferret out of his hands and was like, it's my <laughs> ferret. <laughs> See, I think that my ferret would be very happy with uh, a stranger. Uh, that's what I think would happen to mine. Um, yeah. I, so I, so you, have, you have experience living with ferrets. They are actually real stinky. They're uh, very smelly. And they're not very nice. Uh, they're very cute, but they are not nice. They I, are my, mine, at least in my house, would n- nip at you all the time uh, if they yeah, weren't, yeah. you know, the owner. So, you know. yeah, this is like no, a no whole ferret conversation. No, yeah, I remember it was like jumping up the steps. If anybody else can relate to ferrets, please put it in the chat box. <laughs> it was going up the steps, and I remember Jill was like grab it. I was like, I can't. It's like a snake. It's just kind of like slithering. I'm like, I can't touch it. It's disgusting. So <laughs> anyway, okay. <laughs> so now we've they, gotten that important question clear. <laughs> that was very important. So thank you. And I learned something about you. So thank you. <laughs> so Scott, how do you define creativity? Well, so obviously, as I said, I'm a fan of the podcast. So I, uh, thank you. I kind of prepared for this question and I actually found it surprisingly challenging. Um, Obviously, the reason this podcast works uh, is because there's a tension between sort of the objective and the subjective and sort of like, Mm. you know, creativity when you see it, but it is hard to define. Mm. Um, And to me, I think actually when I, I, it's about parsing the word, right? So creativity, creativity, creating something, I think is the essence of of real creativity, something that can be seen. Like, so if, if I see creativity, I know what creativity is. I had to have seen it. It had to be an experienced. It had to be heard, seen, whatever, however, smelled, whatever your, your creative uh, mm-hmm. endeavor is. Um, and so, but it's not just that. It's, uh, it's the idea that, because there's a lot of people who would define like creative solutions to like work problems. But if it doesn't matter to you really, like if there's no sort of spiritual fulfillment that comes from that endeavor that you've, you've produced something, like, I, I don't think that's sort of in the spirit for me personally of what I think about creativity would be. Uh, mm. There has to be spiritual skin in the game for it to, to be in that, that world. Um, and so, like, a willingness to produce something that gives you, you know, a sense of meaning and fulfillment uh, that you put out to the world. But I think the last part to me that was, that's, that's critical, that's probably the hardest part, is an acceptance of what the world does with it and yet that could be positive negative or probably the worst of all of it is indifference and just mm-hmm. facing up to that um because that is the hardest thing nowadays when you know and especially as i look at myself as an entrepreneur failure success whatever indifference they're all they're all blended into sort of how i, I look forward and how i deal with my day to day um but that to me is the key to creativity is something you create something for somebody else and it gives you purpose and meaning and you're okay with whatever comes of it if even if it's nothing so what you said in the second term i don't know sounded a little bit different to me and i really okay. it was interesting what you just said cuz what i kind of grabbed for myself from the first one that 
I really caught on to what you said about spiritual fulfillment and mm-hmm. that you have to have spiritual skin in the game. Mm. And yeah, I just think that that's a really um, powerful point aspect to come from um because it's a sense of meaning it's coming from like a higher purpose Mm -hmm. and then you then you touched on that entrepreneur aspect which is where you have such a commitment to you're kind of reliant in a sense there's that whole philosophy of well if you become like well are they gonna like it are they not gonna like it then you're you don't really have that spiritual aspect obviously you're gonna look towards your target audience and everything and see what they need and find their pain points and all that kind of stuff. But if you're only living in, are they going to like it? Then that spiritual essence isn't there, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the entrepreneurial connection is a fascinating one to me personally, um, because there's, there's two different, like you can define success and of, of a venture in in a bunch of different ways. Um, Business wise, it's super easy to define success. Did you make money or not? Um, so there's a very objective criteria for like a version of success when it comes to entrepreneurship. Um, I, when it comes to what I'm, what I'm approaching with my, with my venture and how I think about some of the most inspiring entrepreneurs is they, they put something out there and they attached a business to it because they just did, but they didn't do it because it was a business. Um, they made mm-hmm. art and they found a way to make that art make money or or not make money um and i mean i i don't want i don't you know steve jobs is a complicated character when you go you know one layer deep but like that man wanted to make art and like that art had purpose um and had obviously business utility and so they were successful but like there's not many people would make the inside of a computer beautiful (laughs) and like there's something intrinsically it's like sexy and beautiful yeah yeah um but it's passion right it's it's you have to have it to especially at these early stages um when you just you don't know the future i i have no idea if gradiverse is going to succeed or fail um but i am putting it out there because it it brings me meaning and i think it can be helpful to a lot of people um and i can only do what I can to make other people know about it um, and it'll succeed or fail and I'll, I'll see what the future holds. Um, but that to me, like blending of creativity and, and entrepreneurship, it makes sense if you're, if you're doing it right, I think. Mm-hmm. Talk to us about um, Gradiverse because you, you've told us kind of about your journey and somewhat and, here you've created this space and you've there's been such learning curves and all of this kind of stuff so tell us about gradiverse please so i'll give you a little bit of the the sort of the evolution that got me here um when i when i turned the page on on my my flying five finance career and i decided i wanted to do something in technology um and i'll call it meaningful tech uh, because i think in the last half decade or so we've seen tech has sort of you know filtered into every segment of our of our life and our experience and we're on our phones every three seconds whether we want to be or not um it felt like to me there wasn't enough intentionality to how we were approaching our use of technology um and so to me intentionality with our days time i've always been obsessed with time uh, because for us it's so finite um but for the universe it's fast um so like it's 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 a, a thing that i don't want to waste any of it uh, and it's so easy to waste waste time and, and not intentionally use your time. So I wanted to have my venture connect intentionality to things that we don't traditionally connect intentionality to. So mm-hmm. I started actually without having any any development experience or tech skills, really, um, building a platform called Ultimately, which was really hitting on this idea of what are we doing with our time digitally uh, can we make it a more intentional space to not just be a place to spend time now, but also something that we, we consciously know in, indoors beyond our, our lives. So like right now we're creating digital legacies by accident all the time. Yeah. Um, you know, what we post on Facebook or Instagram or whatever, like, and, you know, unless those platforms shut down, like that's going to be there for as long as the servers are running. And that might be 
a long time. <laughs> so right. like in a way that we would look back on our great grandparents and there's like two, two, you know, black and white granny photos. <laughs> um, there is a whole wealth of information that's going to be out there about us. You know, if I think about my children, I got two little kids and my daughters have thousands and thousands and thousands of pictures of them right now in, in the, on the servers that are shared amongst family. And, and, you know, a bunch of them has gone into social spaces and like, that's just not the world that we grew up in or are, you know, let alone the ones of past generations. And so the, to me, I wanted to create some sort of intentionality in technology. So I started with ultimately with no tech, really no business starting a tech company, um, used, uh, you know, third party developers built it. And what I realized quickly with, with ultimately <coughs> that it was, it was a very big concept and it was going to be something that if I had 10 minutes to explain the idea of what legacy are you building and how you can, you connect that to intentionality today, people got it. It's a lot, it's a lot like the life coaching exercise. And I ended up actually getting certified as a life coach as part of this experience. Scott, I'm sorry for one minute. I had yeah. to cough. So hold on. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> Oh my God. Sorry, everybody. Oh, it is, uh, it is okay. As, as long as, long as uh, you don't do it in a public space and get weird looks. I uh, know. I everything's okay. I just, <laughs> getting taboo. over COVID, every once in a while I get these coughing bits oh, and yes. I have to um, ask my son for water. I just don't want to interrupt and um, I'm sorry to have interrupted your flow. It is okay. Yeah, I, I am sorry that you're still dealing with some lingering effects. I know uh, it impacts people very in a wide range of ways. God, sorry, everybody. So this okay. is where I wish I could be in a studio with you. I would give you a glass of water. Uh, <laughs> I just <laughs> texted my son. I hope he's home. I'm like, can you please get me water? <laughs> I could tell you if I texted my my six year old or my two year old, water would not show up. Uh, <laughs> They bring you like your little one, bring you a bottle, be like, here, dad. Yeah. Here's Biddy. Oh. Thank you for the blanket, Eliza, but that's not what I needed right now. Um, well, he said not home. Sorry. Okay. So, okay. so anyway, go ahead. So what I anyway, realized with ultimately is that um, I had, I had a very interesting concept that required a lot of handholding to get to people, to get people to understand what I was trying to get at. Um, and that, works if you have a certain type of business. If I wanted to be a life coach and this is a companion product or something like that, it could have worked. But that really wasn't what I wanted to do. I wanted something that would, could scale organically um, on its own without 10 minutes of explanation because that's just, that's not going to work. Mm. Um, so I, I, had, I took it, I had a choice about like, okay, what do I want to do here um, with, this, with this product that I, I built? And one thing that was working was this piece on gratitude. Um, uh, the idea of gratitude journaling, but not just gratitude journaling um, for yourself, gratitude journaling in a way that includes other people. And I, the idea with ultimately is your gratitude journal and it would be collective, but it would be part of your, your legacy for ultimate. Mm -hmm. um, so I had this opportunity to say like, okay, people like this part. It's something that brings joy. It's, it's super easy to do. It's a sticky habit. Um, why don't I make this? Why don't I make this its own thing? Uh, and so I really leaned into that idea of a gratitude practice is great, but a gratitude practice done with other people is special. Hmm. Uh, and it's, and there's actually research that backs this up is when you have, when you are, and you have a gratitude practice, there's research that shows it helps you in a whole slew of ways, mental health, stress, anxiety, better sleep, better immunity. Like it's amazing how many things, if you just take the time in a given day to record good things that happen to you, things that you're grateful for, um, learning experiences, the, the simple journaling, very simple journaling in, in, in a way that things that you appreciate, how many benefits can happen to you personally. It, it's really amazing. Uh, and then better yet, there's research that backs up. If you are thankful outwardly to other people that it brings you joy it improves the relationship with that person and that person also improves, you know, they have, they get some benefits to their mental health, their, their well being, their, their sense of, of pride. Um, one step further, which is what I thought was the key differentiator for what we're doing here is the act of observing gratitude. So let's just say you watched two people be grateful to each other. You seeing that brings you positive 
mm. positive attributes. So like there is an observer benefit that comes from observing gratitude not and to, to being the gratitude giver and to being the gratitude recipient. So there's a, there's a virtuous cycle that can be built in positivity that feels like the perfect antidote to some of the sort of the darkness that's happening all around us in social and the toxicity that's happening <clears throat> right now. So I, yeah. that's what I really, I, I saw the opportunity there. There's research that backs it. Um, and I think that really this is a chance for us to build something special. It really, and it's that connection. It's that simplicity. I, I know when we had our pre-chat and then mm -hmm. what you're saying here and just really stressing, it's so simple. So he created mm -hmm. this app where you go into the space and instead of maybe putting it in, a, instead of putting it in a journal, you mm -hmm. put it there mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you can follow each other and you can connect with, I can connect with someone in Iceland and mm -hmm. Australia and Colorado and mm -hmm. It's, it's like you said, it's lifting, um, the darkness and, um, it's, it's just a, it's beautiful and easy and it has nothing but positive effects. Thank you. Yeah. And we, we worked real hard. Um, me and my co-founder who came on, you know, in the last year, uh, <clears throat> to, to make it a, a place that's really, it, we've taken out some of the, the tough user design things that are in the interfaces and social, some of which we were very used to and we are, and we, we like, but like, one of the things that we were, that I think is really important about Radiverse, and it's interesting because it, you know it, it comes back to our conversation about creativity, is you being willing to put something out there into the world, regardless of the reaction to it. Um, and when, if you think about how we we use social now um, and how social is designed, it's so dependent on those one touch reactions. So mm -hmm. you cannot help; you are hardwired in your brain to look for the likes, how many people like my post um, when you go to Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, whatever it is. Like we, right. we, it is a biological dependency for us to get validation externally. But like we have, we have taken that and hijacked it to a point where it's not really healthy. And so right. what, we, what we did on Grativerse is one of our tenants of the platform is don't, you can't judge the, the gratitude of somebody else. That's not what we want to do here. You know, you, people are grateful for all kinds of things and there's no one to touch reactions. So you are putting your gratitude into Grativerse and you're not looking to see how many people liked it or cl clapped it, applauded it. Um, because I think if there's, if we're being honest, there's, there's a, there's a culture right now where we're trying to figure out how to deal with sort of um, toxic positivity too. Um, because, you know, or trying to, you know, put in a certain face out there to the world that, you know, will get you the response you want from, you know, your friends or, and, and networks. And like, that's not what gratitude adrenaline is about. That's not what gra gratitude practice is about. It's about you finding gratitude in your day, um, and being grateful to others and for others. Uh, and it's not about doing that to get a response. It's, you know, and we can't help it. I, I can't help it when I, when I go to my group chat with my friends who I have known since middle school and like, there is, this is crazy. But if I make a, a sarcastic quip and I don't get four likes from my, from my five friends, I don't feel good. And that mm -hmm. is insane. Patently insane. Like my friends are going nowhere. It doesn't matter <clears throat> what they, what they think about my, my one little, little quip. So why am I looking for it? It's not, it's not a healthy dynamic. Uh, so we've been trying real hard to sort of make some of those tough choices when it comes to how we approach our, our experience. Yeah, I appreciate it. And it, it's, it's, it's so true. I mean, I guess it evolves right through the generations. Um, here we're looking through validation through cause social media is such a thing and it's a mm -hmm. huge part of everybody's life prior to social media, there was real life interactions mm -hmm. and the real life interactions in those, you were looking for validation and in those ways. So yes, we are hardwired for that um, in whatever the validation was in that sense of somebody yeah. saying something that they liked or um, whatever it looked like uh, yeah. in that way. But um, yeah, it. When I remember we were talking before about toxic positivity and I was glad yeah. that you brought that up yeah. <clears throat> because I wanted you, which you did expand on it um, about... Uh, when we had our initial chat, I was kind of like, yeah, I remember he talked about that. And I wanted to remember exactly the framework. And yeah, it's putting on that certain face. Um, it's, it's not being authentic, right? Yeah. And I think, 
and I guess there's another term of like virtue signaling that is that goes that gets put out there. Um, the idea of you putting on a certain public persona, knowing that it will get a certain response. Um, it, it, it's connected to this idea, right? Of I, I am validating who I put out there, my personal, you know, brand, if you will, by the quantity of, of positive responses it gets, um, or just even frankly, just responses. As I said, indifference can be the biggest can be the biggest hurdle. A dislike and a like, you know, are different, but like they're either of them. Somebody saw you and are saying something about what they saw. You know, not being yeah. seen is, is probably the hardest of all. Um, and but like we we have been very conscious of that like gratitude to 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 the grativerse is not something that is about finding all positive things this is not a positivity only place that we fill mm. because gratitude is not all positive we are, that's we important be, that's really important, important to underline everybody that's yeah. just like it's not this toxic positivity and thank you for leading into that mm -hmm. and then we're going to go into our second question it's just like that's the point of, uh, like I saw a post in here, I'm grateful that uh, their partner was okay through a colonoscopy that they yeah. had. Um, yeah. I'm grateful that someone is healthy and like it's, it doesn't have to be, it, it's just not like, oh, I'm grateful for the sun today and and just those, ended those at that, too. Yeah, which are good, wrong. which yeah. are good, which are good. <laughs> and I'm not saying that isn't good, but it's also just recognizing that it's a full spectrum. Yeah, absolutely. And I you think don't have to feel key. bad about it. No, because I think yeah. people feel guilty about certain things. Like, am I not being grateful? Yeah. Even yeah. though I feel kind of crappy about this, like, am yeah. I like, am I not a good person? Yeah, absolutely. I think then this is something that's. Uh, I, I have this this tension myself personally. Uh, I am I am not a bubbly person uh, to to my friends and and, and network. I am, I have actually, you know, my high school nickname with my close group of friends was the anti-fun. So call you whatever you want. Like I am like, I've always been a little bit of a curmudgeonly old man personality. <laughs> um, but the idea of gratitude to me is not an anathema to that because I'm not forcing happy thoughts here. I'm not trying to like will myself to be a bubbly person with happy gratitude thoughts that I put into the grativerse. It's to me authenticity is so key and being grateful for a whole slew of things, some of which are, are bubbly and some of which are really dark. Like I could take I could be appreciative of traumatic experience because it helped form me into the person I am. I can experience, I can appreciate and be grateful for loss uh, because it makes me appreciate my time with that individual and the, the, you know, how special the time and my current people who are still with us are like, these are, these are not happy <clears throat> Pot, like bubbly thoughts these these are really these are tough things sometimes to reconcile with but the idea of being able to flip something that could be really you know a downward spiral for you uh and get your brain to to whiplash back to like i give the example of you know my tire i blew a tire in my car your first response is always no matter how bubbly a person you are or how grateful a person you are, your first response is always going to be ah, that yeah. sucks um <laughs> right but if somebody has been really working on a gratitude practice and cultivating a, gra a grateful mindset, it's that response doesn't go away. You never get rid of it. The, but the in, tw in 25, 30 seconds, two minutes, 10 minutes, whatever it is, it's a, you know, you've built yourself. You go, well, you know what? It had been 10 years since the last time I blew a tire. Like that was a good run. <laughs> and like, right, there's exactly. just something special about being able to get yourself to that place within some you know, critical amount of time and not dwell. Because uh, we all we all fester with things, and so it's it's helpful to not have to be able to do. That. Yeah, and uh, you know, is everybody okay? And I was able to get yeah. to the side of the road, and thank exactly. God I had AAA, and mm -hmm. and now I can actually have some chill time to do something. And yeah, yeah, yeah it's, absolutely, it exactly. is. It's exactly. the um, yeah, the glass half full, half empty. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so Scott, how do you incorporate more creativity into your own life, both? things that you enjoy personally in your work that you want to expand on wherever you sure. want to go. I mean, I, uh, it was funny. I was listening to the, your conversation with, with, with Elle, uh, from the last, uh, the last, yeah, podcast. she was so and fun she to was, talk She to. was great. Um, yeah. on this one and so much of it, I, I, I really, res it really resonated with me. Um, just 
doing doing things. I'm a, I'm a I'm a doer. Like I'm the kind of guy. She she mentioned like you know rather than call a plumber, uh, I'd rather you know try to do it myself. And like I, I'm very much in that mold too. Uh, to my wife's uh, chagrin sometimes. <laughs> You're the uh, DIY guy. <laughs> yeah, I can uh, fix that. <laughs> yeah, and the answer. Can but, you I mean, fix that? <laughs> one of the things that was really, you know, I, as I said, I did evolve into a programmer. And one of the things that, you know, touching on your question, how do I integrate creativity uh, into into my day? One of the things that's really great about programming in particular is the amount of flexibility <clears throat> it has to get to a certain outcome. Uh, I have never, in my coding experience had something that I couldn't overcome, you know, it may take 10, you know, 10 days, two hours, whatever it'd be. But I've like, if I wanted to get a certain component in my, in my app, you know, front end to work, there was always a way to get it to work. It just, you know, I didn't, I may not have known it, but you know, the, the trial and error and the, the actual work to do it uh, in, in different ways until it, until it did what you need, it was, there's almost limitless options in a lot of times. Um, so development to me has been a really has been a really key growth factor for me to implement creativity because my ultimate endeavor is is Gradiverse. And like I believe deeply in putting Gradiverse out to the world. It gives me that sense of, you know, meaning uh, and purpose that we talked about and what, you know, how I think about creativity. And so mm-hmm. anything that I'm doing in my day, if my ultimate goal is to get the best Gradiverse out to the world that I can uh, to help as many people as I can. Um, that's like, it's almost every part of every minute of my day is somewhat in that, in that, mm-hmm. in that endeavor of creativity. And to some point it's exhausting um, because there's never, I, I always, I can always do something for, for Gradiverse. I could always be working on the UI or sending another email to a potential investor. Like there's, there is no stopping that work, it doesn't stop at five o'clock when I go to get the kids from daycare and school. Uh, Like that's the, I think the hardest part is for me is turning the creativity off. Yes, yes, Um, yes. So so. this is a really good point. So it's balance. It's Mm -hmm. creating that work-life balance. And yes, Mm -hmm. when you're an entrepreneur, when you, it's yeah, like my my daughter and I, um, I think I mentioned this to you before, we uh, would have a thing where before going to sleep, we'd say two things that we're grateful for. Mm -hmm. And she'd look at me and she'd say, it can't be about work, mom. It can't be about work. I'm like, but I love what I do. <laughs> and she's <laughs> like, it has to be broaden your horizons. It has to be something different. Um, so well, your daughter some sounds points- pretty special. <laughs> so that, that, <laughs> you know, my two year old is always when we do we do roses and thorns on the table every night with my wife and, and, the, and the kids. Uh, and the two year old, no matter what, every day is thankful for whatever food is on the plate. Uh, oh. Now, I, I don't know if it's because she hasn't developed the sense of what roses are or if she's just, you know, really like at a, at a, uh, at a meta level. <laughs> because mm-hmm. so. it's right in front of her and she's like, I'm grateful for the food. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, so, and, you know, I'm, I'm, da- I'm dubious of, of that, that being the case because sometimes she's grateful for the food she's not eating. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> So I love that you do this every day. So give, can you give some examples of what, from like a kid perspective and the adult perspective, like what you and your wife might come up with and what they might yeah. come up with? Yeah. Oh, I mean, so the Rose and Thorns is something my wife brought to the family from her experience uh, in academia. And uh, it's it's great. You know, I, I'm not, a, as, as, as you can tell, Gradiverse is not based on the thorns, but I think it is helpful to sometimes res- recognize the thorns and build from them. Um, mm-hmm. And that's the idea. And so I think the kids, if I think about what my daughter, Josie, who's six, what is she grateful for? Uh, Sometimes it's, it's, you know, a good day at school. Um, You know, it's a, you know, a smiley face on her, her calendar report for the day. Um, Mm -hmm. Getting to play a lot of basketball at aftercare. She Mm -hmm. likes basketball, but for whatever reason, she won't watch the Sixers with me yet. Uh, (laughs) She likes to be engaged. Yeah, <laughs> she, I think she's uh, she's surprised when they don't do the uh, the two handed you know between the knees shot. They're like, "What? How are they? I can't do that." Um, <laughs> but uh, so and a, and the thorns are you know they're good. Like they're like you know I, I missed mom when she went on a trip and uh, it was I I got mad at at aftercare at my friend like but like they get it it's not it doesn't take too long i don't know if the two-year-old gets it but the six-year-old gets it Mm -hmm. um and it's 
it's something that we, we really do try to make sure that we, we do with, with them because it's so easy for all of us to just, she wants an iPad, put like, you know, Barbie dream house on Netflix. Don't judge my parents, please. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and like, you know, cause it's a long day for, for my wife. It's a long day for, uh, for me. Right. Um, and so and frankly, it's like a long, I think there's an idea, there's this weird idea in parenting where, you know, you don't want to put in front of screens because they have to keep, you know, learning and building. And I'm like, I don't know, man, that's a long day. <laughs> why, why do we get the relaxation and they don't, that doesn't seem fair. Um, it's a and, really good point. Yeah. And there's the whole creativity in parenting and mm -hmm. the things that you learn along the way and um, all the problem solving, all the, yeah. And it's, it is, it's downtime. I remember in one scenario with uh, our son had a, you know, a diagnosis of, you know, Asperger's and whatever it's, he's an incredible human being. And it, I, I don't know what the, all the diagnoses really mean, but mm -hmm. um one person was saying that when him and his friend would hang out, which could be days at a time, because they would have sleepovers mm -hmm. for maybe like two consecutive days. Mm -hmm. And they'd be like, well, they shouldn't, one shouldn't be playing one game and the other shouldn't be playing another game. That's not engagement. It's like they've been together for 48 hours. <laughs> <laughs> like, they can't be engaged the whole time. Like no. one, they need their own space. No. And that's, you know, we think about COVID. I mean, God, you know, no matter how much you love your spouse or, you know, <laughs> it is, wish. It is a lot. Uh, There's a lot of time. Um, you know, I work my, my I'm looking at my wife's desk two feet from mine right now. Thankfully, she's she's not even here sitting here listening to me. But it, uh, <laughs> it's a lot of time for her. I, we've gotten to the point now where she's like, uh, you're breathing funny. And I'm like, I, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> Man's got to breathe. <laughs> But anyway, it's but true. Yes, yes. We do need to, you know, there's nothing wrong with, it. we don't always have to be, be engaged. Um, but, you know, it's, and now it's, it's hard because I think it, we're trying to figure out the right balance with technology. Like it's too easy to never be engaged. So like, I'm not saying like go the other way. Um, but it is a tension that we're, you know, especially, you know, I'm sure many parents are dealing with, but you know, anybody who's trying to do this world of self-improvement too, you know, when you look at your screen time stats, bull uh so. yeah yeah <laughs> anyway yeah, yeah. sort of wandering there <laughs> no it's okay but i want to go back to um i just want to highlight again what i love what you're doing with your children with the roses and thorns is you're giving them a space to express their emotions yes so you're a six-year-old at this point and as your two-year-old grows um and as your six-year-old gets older you're giving that space to be able to say, I was frustrated because of this. I mm -hmm. had a good, you know, this was exciting and fun. It's just so important to really set the space um, totally. and to do it for yourself in whatever way that looks. If you don't want to share it with anybody, mm -hmm. then you do it in a meditative space or yeah. whatever journal, whatever space it is, but yeah. it, it needs it needs to come out. Yeah, and, and that's actually it's a really important point. And this is one I want to make sure is, is clear for anybody as it actually pertains to Gratibers is like, <clears throat> you know that not everything that you're grateful for is, needs to be public <laughs> public consumption. Like sometimes you want to keep things to yourself and that's totally acceptable. You can do that with private entries on, on Gratibers because I think that like mm -hmm. there's a reason that most of, you know, most people have trended towards gratitude journaling is because, you know, sometimes you don't you don't know when you want something to be public and when you don't um but like if you're not sure you don't want it to be public um and so giving people that ability is was really important because like you know and also you can do it with you know we can do private you know just to between a few people too like so if i had a, a really special moment with my wife um mm -hmm. it's not uncommon that i'll i'll tat i'll mention her in a private post between the two of us because like that way you know the world doesn't need to see everything um, the world needs to see more positivity, but it doesn't need to see everything. <laughs> I love that aspect to it though, mm -hmm. that there's that option of public and private and it can be just another way of like jotting down the idea and it doesn't have to be a whole big, I don't have to yeah. grab all these different things. No, it doesn't have to be a show. Nice element. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the, the idea between what we're trying to build is the best place to build the gratitude habit. And RIR, what makes it special for us is we're doing it in a way that's social and leans into what technology has evolved into. 
but that's uh, the key is still, I mean, the biggest challenge that we are constantly looking at trying to fix is how do we get people to build the habit? Cause we get a number of people who come in and have a great post once and then they have, they just don't, they don't come back. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, I mean, that's consistent with how many people do journaling type practices in the first place. How many people have a journal with one entry <laughs> or you got mm-hmm. a stack of four of them? Um, mm-hmm. Because like it, it's hard to build a habit that that's a virtuous habit. Um, and so one of the things that we, as we evolve and look forward, it's very much into sort of building that. How do we help people build the grateful habit? You know, it was easy for me, but like I'm, I'm, I'm quickly finding it's harder for others. Um, and so we're, that's a lot of what we're trending towards now. Um, and so whatever we can do uh, to help people build the habit of, of a gratitude practice, because that'll just that act of having a gratitude practice will make the world a better place for you personally, but also for the people around you. Uh, so yes. we, think we can do it. We can build up from one at a time. Yes, you can. <laughs> one person at a time and it reaches, it just is like um, the ripple effect. Um, there, there's so much to talk about and we are approaching the top of the hour, but I do want to hear on a little bit of a bigger s- expansion of this mm-hmm. concept that we spoke about before, where you had mentioned that you were an introvert mm. and a lot of this was going beyond your comfort zone. And sure. I like what you said too, about not much difference between me and what I created. Mm. Yeah, no, it, totally. Um, that's one of my favorite forms of um, creative expression is stand up comedy. Um, and the reason for that, and, it, and there's so many parallels to entrepreneurship and is the, is like you are, if you have nothing but yourself out there, um, you, your goal is simple to make people laugh or, or enjoy the, you know, the time and your tools are even more simple. It's just your, your mind, pencil, paper, and how you present something. Uh, and the judgment of whether you did a good or bad job is right there, smack in your face. And that is so, I have so much respect for stand-up comedians um, mm-hmm. because that is really challenging to do. Um, and when you're, when you're building a company uh, that you hope, you know, like, listen, it's, it's, if you open a coffee shop, no judgment, but like you can open, you can put an open sign out there and walk, people will walk by and some people want coffee. But like, if you're trying to build something that's, that you hope millions of people will use, mm-hmm. um, you really, you need to thrust yourself into it. And in the early stages of any startup, the founders like there's no, there's not really any difference between the founder and what they're building. <clears throat> I, you know, Gradiverse is, is me and, and to an extent, my, my co-founder, Tom. And w- if people like it or don't, it is really hard. And that last part, which is what's key is, you know, on, on how we define creativity is accepting indifference, negativity or positivity for whatever it is. Um, because I, when somebody looks at Gradiverse and has a reaction, it's all of me. It's all of my energy. It's all of my time that I can give to it. I mean, like I'm still a you know father and, and husband so I, and friend, but like I do my, I do my best to make sure that I'm balancing to the extent I can. But really my, my passion and my energy and my focus and my days are in making this thing. And it's really, it's challenging to get, uh, to get people to look at it and, and be able and to face any reaction that comes of it. And as somebody who's an, is an introvert, like I'm clearly like, I'm happy to talk to other people, but you put me into like a party scene. I'm the guy on the wall being like, when, when, when can I go home and, and actually, or when can we get after drinks with like three people and not have 40 people here? Um, yeah. So when I, as I try to spread the word, the biggest challenge of any startup is getting the word out about what you've made because there is, you know, how many millions of apps on the, any of the app stores? Like, you know, we are like number 93 right now on if you search gratitude on the app store. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, like, mm-hmm. it, it is, we, the, the challenge is, is getting people to know what you, about what you've made. And so there's no choice, but for someone like me to go and be vulnerable out there in public to tell people about it. Um, yeah. And that is, that's hard. Um, getting, you know, reaching out to investors and accepting, you know, an answer that's no, when you think you created the next most amazing thing in the world. Uh, it, I don't care if people tell you it's not personal. It's personal to me. It's, right. Right. It's, it's, it, exactly. Yeah. Um, because, it's, because it's me. It, it's like, you're just, cause you wear your heart on your sleeve yeah. and, but it is, it's like, what's her name, you know, with Harry Potter, it's, mm-hmm. you know, being homeless and how many times she was told no. Um, when you, 
when you have that passion and when you have that drive and you keep just, you just keep going for it. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's part of us. It's who we are. Yeah. Uh, it's, and yes, I, as I said, it, it's really, if you, be, if you believe in what you're doing and you, and, it, and you think that it can help a lot of people and you think you've got something that really is worth shouting about, it sometimes, it, sometimes you have to go at your nature and shout about it like that. So that's, mm -hmm. that's what I'm trying to do now. Uh, and I would be lying if I said it was natural. It's not. Um, but I'm doing it because I believe in it. And there we go. And we are grateful that you are doing it. <laughs> and I have to bring up that. So someone who is in, so I have a multi-author book mm -hmm. that I'm gathering people for now called Invisible No More Stepping Into the Spotlight. Mm -hmm. And one of my contributors explained something really interesting to me, and I never thought of it this way. She said that being an introvert doesn't mean that you're shy. Mm -hmm. It means that often introverts, um, it's, and it's not necessarily about being empathic, but um, there's a lot of feeling going on and there's a lot of thinking going on. So like we can often see and hear so much from other people's perspectives. So when we step into a space that has a lot of energy and has a lot of kind of noise going on and just a lot of energy, mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of stories, a lot of that it just takes up that space in us and we just need to step back to refuel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, so that's, it's, that's definitely the case. It is it's where you draw your energy from. Is it, is it stepping into the energy or stepping out of the energy? Um, yeah. And that I, I've heard a similar version of that, of that idea of introversion and extroversion. And I totally agree um, because you would be surprised about how somebody acting in a certain way. I don't think any, a lot of people who would see me in a crowd would, think of me as an introvert but right. I am exhausted when I leave a gathering because I have given all of my mental and, and still you know philosophical energy into something that's not ingrained in me right uh, and I think that's because, okay and you're obviously a deep thinker I mean you said that you're and I can see probably as a kid you were like you said you're obsessed with time and how it's obsessed finite for us and vast for the universe yeah. like you're you're a deep thinker and you've always been a deep thinker and it, it takes up energy and space. And I think it's just recognizing it. And it's just important to know how you function in the mm -hmm. world and not beat ourselves up about it to be like, Oh God, I, you know, I just, why don't I like to go and go into these spaces that it's like, because it takes, I can do it for short periods of time and then I can step back and refuel myself and either hang out with a smaller group or just be able to say, you know, I'll see you another day and yeah. that's okay. <laughs> yeah, no, and that's okay. And I think that there's, um, it's an interesting, and as I talked about my, my, my growing up, my parents were very, were, have been great and very supportive of what I'm doing in my sort of evolution and this whole career. I couldn't ask for more from, from parents. Uh, one thing that I would say I would quibble with was, you know, they, they were big proponents of networking in like a pure, in like a sort of a, whatever that term means, but like, Make sure you're like getting out there, being sale, like being salesy of yourself, and you make sure you're connecting with lots of people. And that was always something that just seemed like I, uh, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, and what I've been, I, you know, what I've learned over the years is I am much better at making two really good connections from an event than I am from getting seventy names to put into LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. um, and so, is that better or worse? I don't know. Um, but like, I think there's, there are positives and, and negatives to, uh, to how you approach these things and being kind with yourself and setting yourself up to succeed. Like there's one thing to put, push yourself when you have to push yourself, but also like, there are other ways for me to meet people and connect with people that right. don't have to go to networking events. Like it's okay. Um, I'm not saying I don't do those, th those types of things, but right. having a permission structure with yourself and also like kind of a strategic understanding of what you're going to do well in. Um, like set yourself up to succeed, not fail. <laughs> like, I, and I think that's okay. Well, that's key, I think, actually. And it's interesting because one of my mentors um, were really kind of doing a deep dive and she's sharing about how um, and reinforcing that it really is about connections. Like people want connection and it doesn't have to be in these traditional ways. Mm -hmm. So it's really about building community, mm -hmm. building trust, 
Yeah. And like you said, those two really good connections are better than 70 people that you can meet who might not care anything about you. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you, you, but you do what works for you. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you find, you find the balance that, that works for you and whatever, and quote unquote works mm -hmm. for you is, I mean, obviously something you can also parse. <laughs> like, <laughs> there, there is a weird, there's a weird dynamic of when do you push yourself beyond your limits and, or what your current limits are and when do you not? There's, you know, there's no good answer sometimes. Um, but, you know, we all know ourselves. Uh, and I think the, the, our guts are usually pretty good at giving us a sense for when you're, when you're reaching, you're reaching out when you should and when you're not. Yeah. Yeah. We just learn. That's where all the contrast comes in. You're like, oh, that kind of sucked. Shouldn't have done that. Oh, <laughs> learn that. Chalk that up. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. So as we're getting to the top of the hour and we're wrapping it up, and again, I want to thank all the, those that are here live and liking and sharing the show. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if you have any questions or comments before the show ends, please don't hesitate to put them in the chat box where we can see them and respond. So as we wrap it up and put a nice little bow on everything. So why do you think creativity is important, Scott? Well, I mean, I don't know if we are here without it. Um, I think there's utilitarian creativity, like we talked about, like, but I wouldn't think about it as creativity. Like chimpanzees are creative uh, in how they use sticks, but like they didn't build cities. Um, whether that's good or bad, it's a longer conversation. Um, mm -hmm. For us to have evolved to this place, um, creative endeavors are required and creative endeavors require that extra that extra connection to make work and that, that that ability to put stuff out there in front of other people uh because if you if you put something out there somebody can build on top of it too um mm. that's the you know creativity is not your endeavor is not the end of your creativity your creativity could be the genesis of something way bigger than what you started with but it wouldn't have started without you putting that initial kernel into the world mm. um and so momentum on creativity and virtuous um, building on, on it, is, I think, is what got us here. I love that. Initial kernel momentum, <laughs> extra connections, beautiful, beautiful. Can you please let people know how they can find you, download this app and start getting involved? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So um, on, on the socials, uh, we are at, at Hello Grativerse. Um, and you can download Gradiverse today. Uh, it's on the App Store, or Google Play, and you could also sign up online at Gradiverse.io. So, listen, we'd love to have have you on on the on the platform, and love to hear your your gratitude in the Gradiverse. Yep, and it's so easy. You know, it takes <laughs> seconds to download an app. Just a couple seconds. <laughs> Just a couple seconds. You can do this and be connected, public, private, whatever you want to do, but journal this and just get it out there. Let's, you know, we're like a quilt. We have all mm -hmm. these pieces and we are woven together and the connection is just people, people need it. Um, and people want it. So before we say our goodbyes, uh, Scott, is there anything that you feel like you want to add to the conversation or you feel like you're, you said everything? Well, listen, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank you uh, for oh. the, for the willingness to to have me on your podcast and, and talk gratitude with me, and um, I appreciate everybody who's listening uh, for doing the same and giving it giving it a little bit of your time because, as I said, time's precious. <laughs> so mm. I and I use mine intentionally. And I'm sure you do too. So thank you for using it with me. And yeah. You, Thank you, Scott. I appreciate you. And having these conversations just lights me up. And it's all about the expansion of this definition of creativity, right? So we can expand it beyond a pencil and a paintbrush and see ourselves in it. So um, thank you for all that you're doing. And everybody who joined us live, yes, thank you for taking this hour to hang out with us. And those listening to the replay, we do appreciate your time. And this space is all about inspiring each other, sharing stories and connection. I believe we've always needed it. And I think we need it now more than ever. So please like, follow, share. We're here, obviously, on Podbean and all the other places that you listen to podcasts. Give it a little review. And you know how it helps with all those algorithms and all that good stuff. Um, we are very grateful and appreciate it. So we look forward to talking to you soon. 
and wish you a good morning, a good afternoon, a good evening, wherever you are in this world. And we'll talk to you soon. Goodbye, everybody. Feeling inspired? There are so many ways to do things for you, to get yourself moving, to get your creative juices flowing, and to have fun. Check out I Am Creative and Express Yourself Publishing. Go to IamCreativePhilly.com. I am creative Philly, P H I L L Y dot com. And check out the experiential kits. Check out Creative Shui, which is all about creative inspiration and guidance. And for Express Yourself Publishing, there's so many multi author book opportunities. So I would love to chat with you so much. Everybody has, everybody's creative. Everybody has a voice. Everybody has an expression. And I can't wait to meet you. Thank you so much for taking this hour to listen to our stories and share the energy. And I wish you a wonderful morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in this world. Bye, everybody.